So as you can see, Charlie has a deep connection with our work. His model of compassion and peer support has truly shaped the foundation of CARS Grief Support Services. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Garfield as he speaks on life's greatest gift, love and a life well lived. Okay. together so I probably ought to start with something that's insightful and deep but I can't take credit for it because every time I thought I found something original I found that a poet had been there before me <laughs> and one of the poets who's typically there before the rest of us is a man named David White anybody know David White? You know that name? A wonderful poet some years ago he wrote a poem called Sometimes let me read it to you it's a powerful poem. Sometimes, if you move carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories who could cross a shimmering bed of dry leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests, conceived out of nowhere, but in this place, beginning to lead everywhere. Requests to stop what you're doing right now, to stop who you're becoming while you do it, Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right to go away. One such question that has no right to go away is what is the greatest gift you can give a grieving person? What's the greatest gift? And the answer is that there's no greater gift you can give a grieving person than to ask about their loved one. And then to listen, to listen from the heart, to really listen, not to make believe you're listening. I'll talk a lot more about listening from the heart as we go along. Now another question that has no right to go away, a much, much different question, was posed years ago by the great writer and intellectual Aldous Huxley. It was in a speech that Huxley gave at Los Alamos to mathematicians and physicists and scientists of all stripes. And it was a presentation called Visionary Experience. And he opened the speech with this really compelling question. It's one of those questions that always stumps people. Why are precious stones precious? Why are they precious? Why do we value these colored pebbles so much? And then he answered his own question. He said, precious stones are precious because they remind us of the eternal more than anything else in the material world. Well, today I'd like to speak about something more precious than precious stones. Precious humans. Precious humans working at Kara who remind us of the best in human nature and who do so by embodying the transformative spirit of service. For over 40 years, Kara staff and volunteers have cared for grieving people. They cared as well as they knew how, sometimes in situations that numbed their hearts and minds to their own suffering, but always with the knowledge that love heals, kindness heals, even when it doesn't cure. Now, one other question that has no right to go away is how often do we, you and I, in our daily lives, duplicate what Kara's volunteers and staff do every day? That is, listen deeply to people we care about. Listen deeply to people we care about, from the heart, really from the heart. A lot of times when we listen to people or we pretend to listen to people, we're uh, sort of making believe. We're watching, looking at our watch, and we're thinking about what we're going to do next, and we're imagining that the person is kind of boring. But when we listen from the heart, we listen as if the other person is the focus of a meditation. The other person is really the center of our attention, our focus. What I'll try to do today is emphasize how all of us can open our hearts and minds to grieving people and to each other and to become instruments of love, caring, and service. 
After all, for decades, I've admired how the people at CARA use their skills to attend to the needs of their clients. Skills. We always want skills. And there's nothing wrong with skills, God knows. But actually, CARA's work is not primarily about skills. And it's certainly not about tacking on a few skills to plain old, unchanged me or you. Rather, Cara's work is about a journey of caring and self-transformation from her client and volunteer alike. And what's emerging from Cara's work is nothing less than a new story of grieving. <coughs> now, rich opportunities to see this new story have existed for us all along. You and me. If you've ever gone through a rough situation in your family, if somebody in your life has died, if you've taken care of somebody grieving who you know, you've been through this experience. If you've been through it, if you've really stepped up, if you showed up, if you paid attention, if you cared when somebody else was really in a rough situation, then you've been through this. The first time I got hit particularly hard, the first time I got hit particularly hard was when my dad was diagnosed with liver cancer in late 1990. It was deadly stuff and the prognosis was three to six months. And I was in the uh, what I typically think of as the heroic part of my life. I was in my uh, late 40s and I was speaking and writing and running around the world and doing all sorts of stuff. And I was going to find some cure for this disease that the docs had missed. Can't you see yourself doing something like this? You're going to search. You're going to search for something the docs have missed. And I was on the faculty at the medical school at UCSF, and I went to the stacks. Remember the old days when you had to go to the stacks? <laughs> for anybody under 30 stacks or a bunch of books. And I searched and I searched and I searched for all sorts of stuff in the, in the professional literature. And one day I was in the bookstore and I found a popular book. And that was it. It was it, because nothing in the stacks spoke to me. But this popular book was called Love, Medicine, and Miracles by a surgeon named Bernie Siegel. Anybody remember that book? Yeah, that was a very popular book. It's on the bestseller list. It was a big time book. Well, Bernie Siegel, the surgeon who wrote that book, studied exceptional patients. Patients who had terminal prognoses but survived. They made it. They made it. And then he produced these video cassettes. Remember video cassettes? <laughs> They're in a museum somewhere. But in those days, there were video cassettes of the exceptional patients who spoke about how they did it. How they survived, even though the prognosis was terminal. Wouldn't you want to know if your dad or mom or spouse or friend or somebody you love dearly was dying? Wouldn't you want to know how the, these folks made it? Well, I got the video cassettes. Cold strings, got them, went over to my dad's house. I said, Dad, we've got to watch this. This is going to be really important. And we sat in two parallel recliner chairs. I remember like it was yesterday. This was late 1990. And I popped in the cassette. And there they were, the patients who survived. And they were talking about how they did it. And I was absolutely riveted by it. And yet, a few minutes later, I heard this noise. I looked over. He was out cold, asleep, snoring. And I woke him up. I said, Dad, this is important. This is fight for your life. We've got to understand how these folks did it so you can do it. He said, OK, count me in. Popped it in again. A couple of minutes later, same snoring. <laughs> I figured it must be the medication he'd given him. It must be the stress he's under. He had a whole bunch of reasons to fall asleep. Third time happened again, and I thought, Dad, what is going on here? And he looked at me with this absolutely beatific look on his face. I'd never seen this look before. He said, you know that fight for your life stuff, Charlie? That's not me. That's not me at all. The docs say I only have a little bit of time. I believe them. I don't want to go running around wasting all that time. And then he looked at me. And in a voice I had never heard from that man ever, 
said, Charlie, I love you. And I thought, oh, my God. And my heart opened and broke at the same time. And he made it really clear that he wanted to spend his remaining time with me and my brother and my mom and make memories and make memories. And that's what we did. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. I could have spent that time racing around looking for cures that were never going to come. He lived a, a little while longer. For those at Kara or at Shanti, you heard about Shanti in the introduction. Shanti's 45 years old now. 45 years, and people at Kara would appreciate this. 40, 40, over 40 years without an endowment, having to raise money every single year for doing incredible work. I have another story for you. Stories are important. You know, if you push back the ancestry of, of all of us back far enough, you get to the same place. Whatever the difference in ancestry is here, whatever the diversity is, there's a little diversity here. You get to the same place. A bunch of people sitting around a campfire telling stories. <laughs> telling stories. So I'm going to tell stories. I'm going to, I'm going to let other people tell stories. One of, one of the absolute stars of Shanti in terms of caregiving was a woman named Michaela. Michaela would be here, except she lives in New York and she's working for suicide prevention. But she, she was one of those people that the clients loved. They loved her. They, they, they adored this woman. People at car, there are people at car just like Michaela. And I, uh, I asked her one day, why did they like you so much? And she said, don't embarrass me, please. I said, no, seriously, if I could figure out what it is you do, I could teach everybody else to do the same thing. And she came back a couple of weeks later, she said, I do three things. I show up, a lot of people don't. I really show up. She meant really show up. She, mean, she meant presence. I pay attention. I really pay attention, she said. And I care. I actually do care. I brought her here today on uh, audio. I'd like her to talk to you about a client of hers named Richard. Although it's a Shanti example, the spirit, the heart of it, fits Kara so beautifully. When I first met Richard, he had just been diagnosed with uh, PCP number one. His lover had died a year before that. Richard was a man in his 50s, and he had been an, an accountant, and he had been used to the, the good life at his own home, and he had a 20-something, 25 year partnership, I believe, with his lover, who had died the year before, and consequently he felt very isolated. All his friends had died. The only person, the only contact he had was with one woman about his age, who was his next door neighbor, and the niece of his deceased lover, who was still very supportive. And he loved good food, he loved to cook, he loved good music, and he had an incredible music collection. Over a year's time, he had about five hospitalizations in extended time. And the very last hospitalization I knew was going to be his last. And I knew that several days before he was going to be sent off to a skilled nursing facility, I knew he was being sent off to die. And his lover's niece was selling off all his possessions. And he had given his entire music collection to uh, the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Because he said he ceased to, to listen anymore. It didn't thrill him. I was trying to figure out what I could give him because I really considered him a friend. I had this cassette of Maria Callas, a, a collection that I had put together and it was like a 90 minute tape. And I decided that my gift to him would be that I would come into his room. He'd love to be touched. Touch is one of the most important things I find as a provider that I can give people, loving touch. Because in the hospital they're constantly prodded and poked and hurt. 
all the touch that they receive is about pain. So I said, I'm going to massage your feet and your legs and your arms and your back. And he said, oh, wonderful. And, but I didn't tell him about the tape, and I just quietly put it on. The room was dark. I had told his nurse, but that's what I was going to do, so she was not going to come in and bother us. And it was so moving to me, because in this darkened room, as I'm touching him, the room fills with Maria Callas. Just that, oh, that one, I, I think about it, I just have goosebumps. And he opens his eyes and he just stares at the ceiling, like wondering what's happening. Just, and his eyes fill with tears. And I was just very silent. I didn't say anything, I just kept touching him. After she finished her aria, he said, I have forgotten how beautiful. That's all I said. And he just sobbed and I held him. people that I carry with me because of what he gave me. What I regretted was that I didn't know this man before AIDS, you know, a sweet, wonderful, gentle soul. <clears throat> Today, CARS volunteers and staff are revealing a new story of grieving based on three principles that Michaela would understand really well. Three principles that all of us can use in our daily lives. Listening from the heart, Speaking from the heart, acting from the heart. When I say listening from the heart, as I mentioned earlier, holding the other person as if they were the focus of a meditation, really paying attention. 70 to 90% of the information we send to one another is sent non-verbally. The other person knows if you're listening. They know if you're paying attention or not. And then speaking from the heart, speaking your truths as you best know them. Speaking your truths as you best know them. Honestly. Honestly. And then acting from the heart. I have a little story about acting from the heart. When I was at the, the medical center, I was at the Cancer Institute. I was the first mental health professional ever at the... Uh, Cancer Research Institute at UCSF, 40 bed unit, all seriously ill people, one, one mental health professional to deal with the mental health needs of 40 seriously ill people. If that makes no sense to you, it's because it makes no sense. <laughs> and I asked the question, well, who took care of them before I got here? I remember I was the first mental health professional ever on that faculty. They said, well, the docs and nurses take care of them. Au contraire. <laughs> docs and nurses, good people, bright people, attentive people, but much too busy and not trained at dealing with mental health issues. So the real answer to the question is nobody took care of them. I, I tended to get the difficult patients. One day the nurse head nurse said to me, do we have somebody who we can't take care of at all? He's, dri at all we're dri he's driving us crazy, can you go see him? So I went, I went to visit him. I sat down, he said, you passed my test. I said, what test is that? He said, you sat down, nobody else does. <laughs> he said, they come in here to make two minute U-turns at the foot of my bed. They mess with the IV, they pat my pillow, and then they ask me the stupidest question known to the human race. How are you? I'm in a cancer unit. How do you imagine I am? I said, how can I help? He said, what makes you think you can help? I said, well, I hope I can. I'm trying to see if we can improve the relationship you have with the nursing staff so that things work more smoothly. He said, you want to be useful? I said, yes. He said, get me some 
something to drink. Give me some orange juice. Okay. I thought I was going to do something more profound than that, but <laughs> I went off. I got him a quart and a glass. He ignored the glass, drank out of the quart, drank the whole thing. I said, what in the world is going on? He said, that medication they're giving me, they told me it would make me thirsty. I had no idea anybody could be this thirsty. I'm dying of thirst. You show up, Mr. Psychologist, because they think I'm crazy. You show up and ask, how can I help? I'm dying of thirst. What do you think I'm going to say? Get me something to drink. He was right. He was absolutely right. And he taught me the seismic impact of small actions, small kindnesses. The seismic impact of small kindnesses. Acting from the heart. Carver's volunteers and staff have discovered a new story of grieving that begins with the question, who is this situation with this grieving person calling me to be? Who is this situation with this grieving person calling me to be? Those of us who care for the grieving or dying have learned that our hearts are our credentials. Any, uh, anybody from Cara here, and if anybody in your family or your friends ask you, well, what are your credentials for doing this work? Your heart is your credential. After over four decades as a clinical professor of psychology at the School of Medicine at UCSF, I can't believe four decades have gone by. I've learned that sometimes even good people do things that are motivated more by a drive to result for results than by love and kindness. Kara, amazingly enough, has achieved both results and built an organization based on love and kindness. I asked uh, Jim Santucci to give me some Kara highlights, and he sent me these three programs. I don't know how many of you know the organization you're supporting well enough to know what the programs are. You may know them better than I do. How many people know Camp Aaron? If you don't know Camp Aaron, you really should find out about this. How could you not love Camp Aaron? 11 years, 852 kids served. The impact of Camp Aaron is ser in serving children who have suffered the loss of a parent or caregiver is remarkable. For 11 years now, Cara has served so many families impacted by loss. Not only is the camp healing and meaningful for the children and their families, but for the hundreds of volunteers who are transformed annually by their service to the campers. One camper's comment, 13 year old, comment from 2018 sums up the essence of this weekend camp. 13 year old's comment, quote, I learned that it was okay to cry it was so cool to be with a lot of other people who were grieving. This was a haven where the dead's names are uttered as much as the living, and where people can be, truly be who they are and share. We're surrounded by nature and love and people we just met but are already lifelong friends. We can cry in public and truly feel the dead person's presence and share things that keep them alive. We laugh and love and sob and sing and clap and talk. This camp is so special and pure, one of the safest places I've been to. I've seen some of the videos of the camp. It, if your heart's not touched by this, get a cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> the second program, serving first responders. This little organization is taking care of People from the police and fire department and first responders. And this little organization is doing it, and they're doing it remarkably well. Carr has worked with first responders of Palo Alto for many years, starting with the police department and extending to other emergency responders. This year there was a situation where folks from Carr debriefed Palo Alto first responders, including the police and fire department and dispatch teams. There was a specific situation where Carl was asked to help process an event that inundated those peer support teams of a job site death of a 17-year-old. Carl facilitated a group debriefing and followed up with individual meetings for those more comfortable talking one-on-one. -on -one. Not only was Carl able to support those responding to the incident, 
but it was then connected with the workers impacted by the event and provided them with further support. The onside death of the young summertime employee occurred at a local construction company in Redwood City, and it significantly impacted employees, many of whom were monolingual Spanish-speaking people. Folks from CARA conducted debriefings in Spanish, culturally attuned and realizing that considerations needed to be made for debriefing an old male population, they provided a more information-focused debriefing, giving examples of the types of symptoms that may, they might be experiencing to help normalize their grief and follow up with individual support. Amazing. Camp Aaron, first responders, and then the Spanish Services Program. CAR is proud to report that it significantly expanded its Spanish language services program, once again, serving 1,239 individuals and 59 organizations through direct grief support, outreach, and events in 2018, 55% increase over 2017. CAR trained five new volunteers in a three-day, 24-hour intensive, increasing its volunteer team to 20 people. CAR secured two new partnerships now providing on-site grief support in Spanish at four locations. In addition, CARA hosted its second Day of the Dead celebration with over 50 adults and children taking part in this special event. Again, this, this small organization doing this incredible work. Those of you who work for large corporations or did work for large corporations and wonder if you can get things done with the resources you have, after all, we're down to 16,000 employees. <laughs> <laughs> and Little Car is doing all this great work with volunteers who don't get paid, and staff who get paid a little. <laughs> That's not a negative. That's just the way it is in the nonprofit world. These folks never get what they deserve. It's true at Shanti, it's true here, I'm sure. Let me switch gears. Some of us here tonight, and I've already had a couple of conversations that were like this, some of us here tonight are of a certain age. A certain age when grieving and dying are more likely to come calling. I'm going to be 75 in July. Where did all those years go? Where did all those years go? But when you get to a certain age, grieving and dying come calling more often. A question that I know I'm pondering more as time goes on is who will be there for me during my grieving time? Who will be there for me? Please understand that the people you are counting on the most sometimes don't show up. Please understand, here's the good news. The people who show up are sometimes people you least expect. I'm not saying everybody's close people don't show up. Of course that's not true. Some of you are fortunate. The people who you think are going to show up because they love you and they're close to you actually show up. But not always. And then the people who do show up, sometimes it's the second cousin from Philadelphia who you hardly know who called you because she found out about what was going on and she wanted to know if she could help. Fortunately for us, in addition to the honest thinking that our own mortality and that of our loved one demands, we arrive in later life with the knowledge that there are people at CARA available to us who care deeply about this work and about compassionate service as the new common sense. People like Cara who are more and more capable of offering themselves as instruments of caregiving. Men and women who offer their work as loving gifts to their clients. I can say without reservation that all of us who do this work from the heart are a unique asset to humankind. <clears throat> Some have taken a long, hard look at their own mortality and that of their loved ones and have awakened to a sense of their own impermanence. Impermanence and how that sense affects the way they live their lives. For nearly a half century, it's unbelievable, for nearly a half century I've worked with such people who've struggled mightily to understand the lessons of their work. Men and women whose caring for the grieving and dying has been deepened by psychological awareness, spiritual practice, and a compassionate community of kindred spirits like that at Cara. 
So why is Kara's work particularly important at this point in our collective history? In this world of ours that screams of self-concern and looking out for number one, Kara's work is particularly important because it's revealing a new story of love, caring, and a transformative spirit of service. A new story of grieving and caring that just may, just may reveal itself in time for you and me and those we love. Those who do this work often ask, how do we live and work in this crucible of turmoil and suffering along with all the challenges of modern daily life? How do they do it? There are people here in this room, I know, I know you're here, who are thinking, I can never do that work. I can never do that work. I don't know how they do it. I'll support them because I know they are good people doing good work, but I could never do it. Yeah, you could. Yes, you could. You bet you could with some support and a few skills and some training, you can do it. Moreover, you're gonna to have to do it at some point. Either that or you're gonna abandon the people you love most in the world, and I know you don't want to do that. After all, the encounter with grief is filled with fear and intimacy and despair and love and devotion. How do we live, often for years, in this crucible of turmoil? How do we learn that grief has a life of its own that we can come to identify and serve? How can we best open ourselves to this new story of grief, which all too often confronts us with questions that have no easy answers? When we think of such people as Michaela and my dad and the good folks at Cara, we realize that the need to care is as basic a human need as the need for care. The need to care is as powerful and basic as the need for care. Kara teaches us about the radically social nature of life, the radically social nature of life, particularly in difficult times. We need each other. Kara speaks to us of compassion. Compassion means to suffer with. It's an imaginative entrance into the world of another person's pain. Through compassion, we close the distance between one person's experience and another's and we start to heal the divisions between us. Now one of the vital lessons that Kara's told us, a lesson invaluable to anyone who works in an organization, this for those, anybody who works in an organization or has, is that the quality of service that we offer our clients, our patients, or our customers for that matter, the quality of service that we offer our clients, patients, or customers will be no better than the quality of service we offer each other, isn't it? in the organization. It's an ethic of service. Do you really mean it? Cara does. When working in healthcare specifically, and that's where so much of my work has been historically, we come to see that due to stress overload, bereavement overload, multiple loss, and last but hardly least, increasingly bureaucratic and dysfunctional organizations, which are themselves enduring traumatic stress, and operating in a kind of siege mentality. They, can, they create the conditions for burnout. And yet Cara's volunteers instead show us that we can do such difficult work, often for years, and still feel renewed and rewarded. How do they do that? How do they do that? What are the rewards? Big bucks? I don't think so. The, what are the rewards? You tell me what are the rewards. Think of it. Carr has taught all of us how to avoid a terrible trap of other organizations, large and small. All too often, our healthcare organizations are losing track of their caring missions and focusing their time and energy not on superior service delivery, but on financial matters and staying alive as organizations by slipping more and more into corporate style hierarchy, rigidity, and sadly executed downsizings, which crush our health professionals and volunteers in the process. The problem with crushing our caregivers is that we then have to serve our clients or patients with crushed people. It'll never happen. The bottom line, as Cara has shown us, is that the old command and control boss subordinate paradigm is dead. The old command and control boss support, boss subordinate paradigm is dead. I don't mean the people practicing it are dead yet. But. <laughs> It's an old story, folks. It's a story that's being replaced by a patient-centered, team-based, 
partnership story in which a chain of caring exists from the boardroom to the client. After all, caregivers and many healthcare organizations continue to tell us that the reason they burn out is, is due to organizations that don't work, not the work itself. It's, it's true in non-healthcare related organizations as well. The reason that people burn out is often because of dysfunctional organizations, not the work itself. Tara and its circle of exemplary care providers offers an antidote to the conditions for such burnout. Now let me change gears yet again and say, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a bit more about the history of Cara, because after all, that history is with us right now, here in this very room. Cara's history of precious work makes this place, this room, a temenos, temenos, word, an ancient Greek word meaning sacred space sacred space, inhabited by the beloved ghosts and memories of those we've loved and lost. They're here with us, here. They're in our hearts. Standing here today, I remember Cara's early days well and how this wonderful organization has always been a community of memory as well as a community of volunteers and staff. In those early years, Cara used the same peer support model of caregiving that it uses today. The model I was fortunate enough they introduced at UCSF Medical School in 1974. A volunteer peer-based model based, as I've said, on three principles. Listening from the heart, speaking from the heart, acting from the heart. Embodying these principles, CARA volunteers in the 1970s and those that serve today do their work as neighbors with skills. That's who they are. You're all back the clock 200 years. And there's a little town here, maybe Palo Alto was a little town 100 years ago, 200 years, I don't know the history. But. And if somebody got sick, the neighbors came over and helped. Now we don't even know who they are. And since they don't drive a Tesla, I don't want to know them. <laughs> neighbors with skills. Neighbors with skills. These neighbors with skills, these car volunteers, were often the difference between zero and one. Often these volunteers who do this work are the difference between zero and one. The difference between having one person who shows up, pays attention, and cares, and having nobody. And having nobody. So now, in 2019, I've come to realize that three vital lessons stand out in Kara's decades-long journey of compassion. Three vital lessons. First, again, as I said earlier, the need to care is as basic a human need as the need for care. I think I can prove that. At least I have a story and I'm sticking to it. If you roll back the clock way back into our prehistory, when we walked on all fours, one day, Big moment in sports, folks. Somebody stood up. <laughs> one of those four-leggeds was the first one to ever stand up. This must have happened. And the view was a lot different. I mean, two legs, all of a sudden, it is a lot different. I like to believe that the first thing that that new two-legged did was to help somebody else out. Hey, you got to see this however they said it. <laughs> you gotta see this and they help someone else become a two-legged. The need to care is as basic a human need as the need for care. Second, is the realization that the experience of being cared for can be as important to those we serve as anything we say or do. The experience, just the experience of being cared for is an amazing experience. And third, one more time, Cara's most important lesson and life's greatest gift. Love heals. Love heals. It doesn't always cure. There's a difference between healing and curing. You can heal somebody emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, interpersonally, even if you don't heal them physically. Finally, I'd like to paraphrase a, a Zen Buddhist saying that captures our admiration and respect for all CARA volunteers and staff from the 1970s on to today. 
infinite gratitude to all CARA volunteers and staff past, infinite service to all CARA volunteers and staff present, and infinite responsibility to all CARA volunteers and staff future. And to honor CARA's clients now, in the past, and in the future, people we cherish as we think of them today, I ask all of us to hold three things in our hearts. See if you can do this. Love always. Serve always. Remember always. <laughs>